Welcome back to the session on freshwater ecosystems management and governance. In this video, we will introduce some major water policies, recognizing that these develop over time. Successive policies draw on what has gone before. As an example of a recent policy, we will draw on the European Water Framework Directive as a very wide ranging policy for the protection of fresh water and ecosystems. We will then consider what can be termed key lessons from practice, leading finally to a brief introduction to, of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the need for integrated water management. Water quality assessment schemes supported by national policies, international agreements and protocols have been in place in many places for a considerable amount of time. One of the first major pieces of national binding legislation was the US Clean Water Act 1972, on which other water policies have learned and developed from that. Some policies manifest as legislation with specific requirements for compliance. Others, such as the idea of integrated water resource management, are more aspirational, provided as some guiding principle By way of example, ecosystem protection in Europe has been subject to a development of policies since the 1970s, with a succession of council directives, these are European-based legislation for which member states are committed and need to be transposed into the national legislation of each of those member states. So those policies developed on a variety of water-related issues throughout the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. However, it was recognized towards the end of the last century that this legislation in total was quite disconnected and often known as piecemeal. And so in order to, to, to bring and consolidate these different directives into one overarching policy or framework led to the development of the European Water Framework Directive. What was interesting, or what is interesting about the Water Framework Directive is that it is based on ecosystem health as measured by the biota. So a number of biotic elements, uh, invertebrates, phytoplankton, phytobenthus, and fish are used as a means of deciding and determining whether or not any particular water body meets a high, a good, a moderate, a poor, or a bad quality status. The European Directive, European Water Framework Directive, requires legally that all water bodies, unless they have derogation, all water bodies had to have met at least good status by 2015 following the implementation of the directive in 2000. And the way that these, these, this ecological status is decided is by a measurement of the biotic elements, so-called biotic elements, supported by water chemistry and what is known as hydromorphology, which is the hydrological and the physical state of a water body. And there was a comparison between the observed values compared with the reference value. And we spoke about reference values and baselines in the, previous, in the previous session. The Water Framework Directive has some overarching aims. It has 27 articles to it, 26 articles, but it has some overarching aims. To set a framework for the comprehensive management of water resources <clears throat> within a common approach and with common objectives. It aims to prevent deterioration of water status and to achieve this good status by a certain date. It assesses waters on the basis of their ecology, which is a departure from the traditions of basing water quality assessments on chemistry. And it has embedded in its operation things known as river basin management plans that have defined planning and reporting cycles. 
So drawing on that legislation and drawing on some of the issues concerned with that legislation and thinking about not just the Water Framework Directive, the European policy, but also the global perspective, we can introduce some what we might call key lessons from practice in terms of what are the key principles to do with water policy, management, and in the context of this session, particularly governance. And so I want to think very carefully now about how does the governance aspect link in to those other management components. So knowledge in general is contested and co-produced. From the early days of the single issue of the Great Stink in London, if you remember from the previous session, there is now broad acceptance of the need for multiple actors to be involved in water management and increasingly the importance and recognition of that importance of links with ecosystem management and protection. It is recognized that different perspectives are needed for integrated management and that these together can improve management leading to better outcomes. Policy conflicts remain and there will always be tensions across different interests and policy objectives and different interest groups. But recognizing these is a key to solving water management problems. The knowledge that is used for management is therefore inherently contested and co-produced. And we can recognize that that knowledge comprises expert knowledge, technical knowledge, maybe many of the people involved watching this uh, video would come from this field. But it also depends on what we might term bureaucratic knowledge. How does the administrative framework work? What are those management protocols that we spoke about and the management process that we spoke about in the last session? And increasingly, it is involving stakeholder knowledge. So the validity of results, the validity of policies depends on the bringing together of these different groups. And increasingly, and for better water policy, this knowledge is co-produced. Recognizing the role of experts, bureaucrats, and stakeholders, techniques used to develop knowledge, and also the integration of that knowledge, and how that knowledge is actually used for decision-making. These are all very important points. And also they relate very strongly to the idea of governance and therefore to legitimacy of decision-making. So lesson number two might be that management does not happen in a vacuum, but is embedded in a water governance cycle. Multiple actors involved in water management emphasize the nature of and the need for effective governance. Management and monitoring that are needed are embedded in that. And they are embedded in what you might consider also to be a governance cycle as well as a management cycle. It includes the policies, the institutions, formal and informal, and actions. It includes reliability of indicators, evaluation of successes and failures, and therefore development of the processes themselves. So it goes far beyond just the measurement of water chemistry or elements of the biotic ecological world. It connects these with decision-making and the validity and the legitimacy of those decisions. So a typical water management cycle will, will kind of look something like this, surrounded by a central core, recognizing the importance of water governance. And the link provides a, a very useful introduction to, to water governance in general. So when we think about water management and water governance, we have to think about the actors and recognize that different users are going to use information for different purposes. There are difference in how things are done in the public and the private sphere. In the public sphere, there was a much greater need and requirement for accountability, less so in the private sphere. And 
the scientific process that gains insight to how data is collected, how it should be collected, how it is analyzed, what are those data used for, that then connects between the scientists and the data aggregators with the policy makers and the decision makers. And they are involved in a decision cycle, the policy cycle, where they can recognize processes such as we recognize, such as we introduced previously. And then the data aggregators, the scientists and the policy makers are very connected in terms of policy implementation. But increasingly, the private sphere, the citizens, citizen society organizations, as well as individuals, are connected with these with these other with these other dimensions. So if we think about the scientists and the data aggregators and that connection with policymakers and decisions, we can think about how do they engage with each other. And this is the traditional science policy dialogue connection in terms of determining policy and validating that policy. But increasingly, there are new forms of engagement and increasing role for the citizen society organizations. And that participatory process is one which is becoming a much more formalized and understandable one. Well, the nature of it is, is, is better elucidated than the past, and we'll come on to that in a couple of slides. And it becomes relevant because here we have new forms of engagement. Citizen observations then also become a particular component of science. So the citizens are not only engaged in the policy dialogue, the scientists are not only engaged with the policy dialogue, but the citizens are engaged with the science dialogue. And citizen groups increasingly become uh, key components and major players in the collection of data and the validity of those data. And so we can recognize that community-based monitoring may occur outside of these dimensions of policy making and science, but increasingly they are occurring within the dimensions of policy making and science, leading to the more recent development of citizen observatories. So citizen, citizen observatories are identified agreed processes of how the citizens will actually contribute to the science and the policy. And this is increasingly formalized in terms of, of this process. Now, we will learn much more about this in the future sessions to do with, to do with water governments, governance and participation. The Water Framework Directive, which we mentioned earlier, it also has an article, Article 14, that requires that EU member states establish a process of public participation. So what this really is speaking to is lesson number three, that no effective water management is possible without including the people who use the resource. And participatory processes are increasingly advocated for natural resource management. And in the case of the interest of this course, ecosystem protection and freshwater. And increasingly levels of public impact and public participation have been recognized. This goes back to traditional thinking of what was known as Einstein's ladder, where there were various rungs of participation from simply public being informed about something to actually the public and the citizens being part of the decision making and at the decision making table. So we can think about a matrix such as this, where we have participation goal, public participation goal, 
from being informed to consult to be involved to collaborate and to empower so this 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 top row moves from a more traditional being informed about what's going on to a consultation process to a collaborative process and then finally to the decision making in the powers of the public now you can uh, you can have your own judgment about how far along and in different parts of the world and under different circumstances we may be between this first box and this last box in the first box in the first uh, column the promise to the public is to keep them informed so this is again is a traditional view recognized by many where the public are informed there are newsletters or there are announcements there might be even public meetings the second tier the second level of engagement is under consultation is we will acknowledge concerns and provide feedback of how decisions and how those concerns have influenced decision making we can involve you further under the third column here of ensuring that concerns and aspirations are directly reflected in alternatives developed and provide feedback on how that input from the citizens from the from the from the, the citizens society has actually influenced decisions to the upper end of this scale to looking towards the citizens for direct advice direct advice incorporating advice and recommendations into the decision process to the maximum extent possible to actually the citizens being pretty much in control of the process themselves and then there are various levels of 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 support example tools that 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 will support those different processes so lesson number four perhaps is one of the most important lessons and that is there will always be multiple interacting challenges this is where the idea of the wicked problem really sits maybe it's the greatest challenge for management and governance is the accommodation of the resolution of, of multiple interests at the end of the day managing water and ecosystem integrity and health is all about managing risks and maybe that management of risks and the importance of the management of risks is the key lesson number five again drawing on the water framework directive as an example the water framework directive some have argued is effectively a land directive because it relates to what are the pressures that come from the land use on the water and therefore it's all about managing those risks so in the final stages of this of this session i want to just mention the gold standard of the oecd on the water governance principles this is the this this link here again uh, relates to those and you can see that water governance implies and includes a whole range of different aspects that we have talked about and this formalizes the gold standard of water governance principles so as we move into the future the need for effective governance and frankly better governance will become a much more important component as we try to reach targets of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, of which there are 17 goals supported by 165 defined, defined targets. And so bearing in mind what we've had in the two sessions on water management and water governance and its fundamentals, I postulate a number of conclusions. First is that water policy does not emerge from a vacuum, but in response to identified problems, often a crisis. Management is needed where scarcity of resources coincide with conflicts of interests. Understanding ecosystem processes is needed to guide ecosystem management. Governance systems influence the effectiveness of management and are central to, the, to, to that. 
And finally, the pressures on freshwater ecosystems in the future will require greater levels of integrated thinking at national and global scales. So thank you for participating in these last two sessions on water management and, and governance. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of the course. Thanks very much and cheerio.